pioneering solutions, transformational technology, and inspirational leaders. I'm your host, Connor Sherman, and this is the Confident Defense Podcast. Welcome to the Confident Defense Podcast. I'm your host, Connor. And today we've got two exceptional guests I am super excited to have on this, have a conversation with. We've both got Ron and Chris. They are the co-hosts of Hacker. It's a podcast that explores really the human element of cybersecurity, the technology and the programs. It's if like hum- humanity met technology, met the hacker's mindset, and then every week these guys are having a conversation about it. It's a, it's a podcast that I love. If you do not subscribe to it right now, I highly recommend after this conversation, jump on over and subscribe to wherever you get podcasts. I couldn't be more excited. Ron, Chris, welcome to the show. Well, guys, Thanks I'm for having us. I'm just like, once I'm really excited to have you guys here because you guys are talking about something that so few are talking about, which is the humanity of cybersecurity. We talk so much about the technology and the APTs and the solar gate that's going on and the fire IT teams and technology. But at the end of the day, there's humans on the other side of this. So let me just ask the pretty fundamental question. Why did you decide to launch a podcast that was focusing on the humans in cybersecurity versus more of the whiz bang technology? Yeah, you know, we, we talk about this quite often and we really do believe that cybersecurity professionals are mental athletes and we don't have an off season, no breaks. We're playing chess every single day, all day long. And we really need all the help that we can get. And really, when we look at the entirety of a cybersecurity professional, there are so many more things that we can be focused on sharpening the tools in our tool belt. Of course, there's the the technology side, but there's also the very human side where it comes to leadership, productivity, mindfulness, fitness, uh, focus. There's so many other things and aspects that we kind of leave to the wayside when it comes to the cybersecurity practitioner. And so we decided to kind of take that spin because Ron and I, we're really focused on bettering ourselves. We constantly push the envelope. We read the books, we take the courses, we have mentors and coaches that pull us along and we love to take all of the learnings that we learn and give it back to the community. That's, that's awesome. And like Ron, I see that you've got on uh, pretty active on Twitter. They're like uh, motivation Wednesdays and such like these little like encouraging snippets going through. What got you started with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I started the motivation Wednesday because I was journaling. I journal every day and there is a part of my journal prompt that I stole from, I believe it was uh, the five second journal. There's a small snippet in that journal that says, if I was a coach, I would tell myself what? And so every morning when I wake up, I give myself a little coaching. I sometimes I write about, you know, if I do this, then I want that to happen. If I focus on this book, which I'm focused on storytelling right now, then, you know, hey, Ron, stay focused. If you just tell one story a day, you ha- you'll have a book by the end of the year. <laughs> so it was really just translating those things that I was telling myself every morning to LinkedIn posts. Got it. Now, I really like that idea that like, we can have this incremental wins that at the end of the year, at the end of five years, at the end of a larger period of time, it has accumulated into something. Um, I think there's a pretty famous quote that's attributed to, I think it's like Bill Gates or something like that. Uh, you know, one of those people that always gets attributed to on the internet. But basically the thought was, we overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we can do in a decade. Yep. And the idea of that, like you, like you right. said, we can have these daily stories that compile a novel over time. Exactly. And there's a, there's a great Stoic, his name is Ryan Holiday. He has something called the Daily Stoic. And it's just really daily information about his journey uh, to Stoicism. And I'm mm-hmm. looking at it for the same for me, but within the context of coaching. Interesting. Well, it's amazing you mentioned that book. That just arrived from Amazon last week. It's sitting on my shelf over here, just outside of the camera view. <laughs> so um, yeah, nice little tie in there. So yeah, so maybe we should get Ryan on the show here. Um, Let's do it. <laughs> because I mean, what a what a thoughtful individual that guy is, and I love the idea yeah. of being able to take these two thousand year old philosophies, which are all just still as relevant today as they were back in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you guys have been pretty um, set on really this mental athlete thing. As you've had conversations, I think you guys have released almost one hundred and fifty episodes now. What are some of like the daily routines, and what are some of the kind of small tools like journaling that as practitioners, we could be bringing into our lives to really help us level up and have a healthier long-term engagement with what is a pretty intense career. 
Yeah, one thing that we really like to talk about on our show, we talk about it with the people that we meet with, our masterminds, is we talk about mindfulness and we talk about being present in the present moment, which is another stoicism practice, but really getting grounded in what you're doing and focus. Because a lot of times when we get, we live in the future, we live in anxiety, or we live in the past, we live in regret. But when you try to get present in the present moment, you're able to focus on what you need to do. And that's one of the practices that I think that when you have too much context switching and you have that residual context, when you're going from one thing to another, to another, to another, you, you occupy space in your mind that's focused on something you're not even doing anymore. So if you can have that sharp cut and focus on whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to be more present when you're doing work. You're going to be more present with your family. You're going to be more present when you're in an incident. You're going to be more present when you're in a conversation with your boss talking about strategy for cybersecurity. So that's probably one of the main things that you can practice. And I mean, there's so many different ways to practice it, whether it's meditation or just mindfulness practices, go on like walks. Where, where you're not listening to anything and you just go and you observe nature. Or one practice that I have is every single time, and I've done this since my oldest uh, baby was a baby and she's 12 now, every time I pick up one of my kids, I get present in that moment. And I, I, I hold on to that moment because you're only going to be able to pick them up for so long. I'm not picking up my 12 year old anymore, but now I'm picking up my 15 month old baby. And so I always get present because number one, that, that, that grounds me. So I'm no longer thinking about podcasting. I'm no longer thinking about cybersecurity. I'm thinking about being a dad and enjoying that time. So if you take that practice and you apply it to everything else during your day, you'll be more focused and it will be more effective. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty amazing anchor to have those in life, right? So if you have kids like using that, um, and I'm sure if you don't have kids, there are other anchors that we can pull in too. I've got a little mm -hmm. guy too, so I'm uh, just we're getting close to the one year mark with ours. So he's very right. much in the pickup phase. He's like, yeah. now he's asking for it. He's just like mm -hmm. arms reaching out, pick me up, daddy. It's the best feeling ever. <laughs> and, and Ron, what are some of the things that you've uh, would you recommend or just what are some from your perspective that you've been things practice that you really enjoy? Yeah, uh, I'm also a huge fan of mindfulness. I try to meditate for at least 10 minutes a day, maybe 15. If I have an extra time, I try to go 20 minutes. But just even that small block of time goes a long way. Another thing that I do to kind of keep my head on straight, especially after a long, stressful day, we work in cybersecurity. Some of your listeners are probably analysts, practitioners, leaders. You need to blow off some steam. Chris mentioned walking. Um, I like to go to the gym. So if I have the opportunity, I, I always go to the gym every single day. And the real key to my success at the gym is not going hard on myself. So I'm not competing with anyone there. I'm, I'm not competing with myself. It's just an opportunity for me to take care of my mind and my body. So I think like if anyone was trying to t develop that habit, it's all about being gentle with yourself. We had a, a recent guest on Suzanne Falter and she talked about how, you know, busy people, professionals go very hard on themselves and they're trying to develop new habits. They don't sit with that stillness that Chris was talking about. They don't sit with themselves and really understand that there's no competition here. It's all about progressing and getting better slowly every day, whenever you have that opportunity. Yeah, man. The amount of times like I could have heard that needed that guidance in the last past couple of years has been great because it's just so easy <laughs> to fall into that, right? It's just like, we're always trying to hit this high bar that's always moving and especially in cybersecurity. Whereas if you're building and running security programs or you're trying to invest and see around the corner, you've got changes in the market, changes in the business. You have an adversary that's fighting back. You've got humans and you've got a team of people that you want to be working on. People. There's a lot of moving pieces and it really does take a toll. So I think you're right. We just end up in this groove of just kind of like push, 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 push. And sometimes mm -hmm. we just need to say like, no, just keep walking. You don't need to run yeah. today. You just keep walking forward though. <laughs> Right. And you know what I'll add to that? Um, we're up early right now. The listeners might not know what time it is. I'll keep that up to their imagination. But waking up early and giving yourself that space, that opportunity to do whatever you need to do. Maybe it's send out a few extra emails, hopefully not, or you have an opportunity to meditate, work out. Um, I think uh, waking up extremely early, I try to get up by six. And if I'm feeling lucky, maybe even earlier, but just having that extra bit of time to start my day and get, get spun up, 
it always leads to a more successful and fulfilling day. That make that sounds right. <laughs> Makes sense to me, man. I like the idea of just having that extra space. You talk about meditation. I saw a cool quote for that recently. And it was like, meditation is the 10% that unlocks the rest of the 90%. Mm -hmm. And just like these small things. Yes. So speaking of like tools that help us unlock what's next around the corner, you guys have been pretty cool advocates of you've built these frameworks for helping really champion innovation in the security space, but then also just generally around pursuing excellence around adopting new to a, a new becoming master a new skill set and so you've got the, the easy framework and the exist yeah. framework um yeah. <laughs> i'd love to hear from you like can you unpack those for us so we maybe start with the easy framework and then we'll go to the second one um but yeah so what are these frameworks how do we as practitioners incorporate them and leverage these you want to do easy ron uh, sure uh chris originally created easy and I think like we both really just took it and ran with it. Um, but easy is an acronym. E is illicit requirements. A is assess collection plan. S is strive for strive for impact. And Y is yield to feedback. And these are some core tenants that any cybersecurity analyst could use to build really great cybersecurity program. Working as a vendor, you know, years ago, I spent a lot of time working with organizations that didn't even have the requirements fleshed out. They would just try to go in to buy a solution and then implement that solution without really understanding what is that solution going to solve? What is this new cybersecurity program that we're building? What is the purpose of it? So that's where the E for illicit requirements come from. And then the A, assess collection plan, is gathering all the data that's going to help you fulfill those requirements. That's going to help you meet your goals. It's really important to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, working with security teams, you might have a SOC, for instance, and they have a SIM, they have a case management solution, and they have all these tools, but are all these tools cohesive? Are they talking to each other? How do you create a collection plan mm -hmm. to bring all that data in to answer those security-related questions? And then the S, strive for impact. As you're building out your program, there's going to be milestones that you need to hit. You've elicited your requirements. You have those list of requirements. Now you need to start fulfilling them one by one or in bulk if you have that opportunity. And last but not least, the why. The most important part of the easy framework is yielding to feedback. When we introduce security solutions, especially to the SOC, especially to incident responders, sometimes these tools and solutions fall right under their lap without them ever providing feedback about the requirements yeah. that were there and the, the collection plan that was established. There might be other data sources that uh, engineers or um, your directors overlooked. It's up to everyone to provide that feedback and continually improve the program. So that is the easy framework. Got it, got it. I wanna pause there because I think it's a really powerful framework you've got there. And I love this idea that like this yield of feedback, I know it's so simple, right? We talk about <laughs> feedback all the time. It's like this whole agile methodology is built around it. Um, but man, is it easy to skip that like you mm -hmm. just get so in right. love with the idea, the concept of the solution that we forget that somebody has to actually use this thing on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> they have opinions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, and to encapsulate this framework and to package it all up and make it easy for anyone to consume and really understand how to implement it, we've created a course. We uh, teamed up with Attack IQ. Uh, anyone can Google Hacker Valley Studio Easy Framework and enroll in the course. It's completely free, and we break down how to uh, use this framework for building threat intelligence programs. That I will link to in the show notes. So yes, that is really cool. I wasn't aware that you guys had worked that, like well, what a prestigious um, team to be working with on threat intelligence as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And that respect for those guys over there. Yeah. And so what about Exist? Like um, what was the, what, so where, what was the easy and what's Exist? How do they separate? And what, how do we get our heads around that? Yeah, so Exist, you know, for those of, that follow Ron and I, uh, they know we do Think Weeks uh, every so often throughout the year. And during this past Think Week, Ron and I were sitting around, we were thinking, contemplating, having conversations, and then just one day, just boom, in my head popped uh, the Exist framework. And Exist is really for excellence in all things, in all human endeavors, whether it's sports, hobbies, career. Really, you can use it, really, you, you could use it for anything. And EXIST is also an acronym. The EX is EXPLORE. So whenever we're looking to go into anything, like I said, those human endeavors, 
exploring is one of the best things that we can do. There's a book called Range that talks about generalists and how generalists have a leg up on the ones that specialize a little too early. Because you know, you understand a lot of things. And once you find that one thing that you want to really drill down into, sometimes it hits you like a tuning fork. And it's all of a sudden, it's, I have to do this thing. But sometimes it's a slower burn. And slowly but surely, you become good at it. And all of a sudden, it's that thing that you want to kind of do more. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy. So once you explore and you find that thing that you want to do, then you immerse yourself into that world. Because this is really a framework for exploring other worlds. So for instance, when I was younger, I, I knew that dance was a thing, but I didn't know dance was a world. And once I realized that it was an entire world with characters and terminology and experiences, I immersed myself in it. And so I, I was a part of forums where dancers came together and talked about dance and looked at dance videos. I was watching videos. I was listening to music nonstop. I was traveling to events, so I immersed myself into this world. And that's pretty passive in some ways. And so you're, 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 you're almost learning through osmosis. But then once you take that step to active, which is the study, which is the S, you're learning the different tools and techniques and the tradecraft of whatever world that you've just entered. And so what are the courses, what are the mentors, what are the, the books that you need to read to build that tradecraft that you're trying to develop? So recently I've just entered into the study phase of chess. Uh, we had uh, Maurice Ashley, who was a grandmaster in chess, and we had him on the podcast, and he sparked my interest in chess. This is something that I, I knew how the pieces moved, but I had sure. no strategy to it. There was I didn't know anything about it. I would just play and you know hope I win. But now right. I'm starting to apply strategy. I, I have a chess coach. I take the courses. So all of these things are, are in that active study phase. Like, how do you get better? And then ultimately, what you want to do is you want to get to that T, and that T is either translate or transform. Translate can be teaching. You could be teaching kids. You can teach your peers uh, of the things, the experiences, the study, the research, whatever it is that you have, and be able to give that back to them. Or you can transform and innovate. Either you're creating a company, or you're making an invention, or an open source project or even transforming it and making new analytical trade crafts, something completely different. So really taking that experience, taking that entire journey and taking that world and bringing it back to your community. So <clears throat> that is such a lovely um, narrative to go through where we, because I think we start so often, and I know I'm totally guilty of this, we start at the end <laughs> where it's just like, right. how do I get to transformation? Or what do I dive yeah, into 100%. and study? Mm -hmm. and you, totally forgot the exploration portion of this where it's like hmm, maybe you have no idea what you want maybe you actually don't know what you don't know and some you yeah. know some humility and exploration would go a long way you know yeah to understand more so i'm not familiar with think week can you unpack the concept of think week yeah think week is a la yeah, bill absolutely. gates yeah it's uh something that bill gates does i think he does it like what twice a week ron something like that where he goes away twice to a, a, a cabin, or yeah, twice a year. He goes away to a cabin, and uh, he takes a week and just is with his books. Uh, no, I don't think he has access to, to technology or people. He just takes that time to think about the, the most, uh, the hardest problems that he can think of. And so that's what Ron and I do. We take it, and we think about what we want to do with Hacker Valley Studio, or we think about mm -hmm. how we want to make our mark on society, or how do we improve socioeconomic equality, it really ranges from all sorts of different things. And, <clears throat> you know, there, you know, one time we went to the mountains and we just had a cabin and we sat and we focused and we ate really minimalist. Now, Ron is luckily a, a chef when it comes to using the uh, Instapot. <laughs> so we made some great, great things. We did have pizza one night, which was uh, the, probably one of the best pizzas I've ever had in my life after eating uh, potatoes and, and vegetables and rice for a few days, but uh, it still was an, an amazing experience. And if you can uh, afford to take some time away from work, mm -hmm. I definitely encourage people to take some time to think. You can do it by yourself, do it with a partner, uh, but definitely take some time to think because we are so often caught up in doing that we forget to think. Yeah, as my dad used, my late dad used to say, like first and foremost, we're human beings, not human doings. And mm -hmm. this idea that like you just need yes. time to be as well. 
Um, but thank you. I am totally stealing this Think Week idea. I think it's <laughs> so powerful. You know, and as a especially like just bring it back to security for a second. It's just like how often are we constantly on that treadmill? Where we're mm -hmm. updating the next forecast. Mm -hmm. We're helping the sales team with an enablement thing that we have to go through. We're dealing with an adversary over here, and we never have time to like step back and like, are we solving the right problems? Um, I think one of the haunting questions I got early in my career was. I was running a SOC at the time, and the CISO I reported into said, Connor, I see you, you know, we're detecting a lot, but are we detecting the right things? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, at that point in time, I hadn't wrapped my head around that like volume wasn't the solution, right? It wasn't trying mm -hmm. to detect everything. It was like prioritization, right. all that jazz. But this idea, like had I had that tool and had you know a quarterly basis where I was stepping out and thinking more strategically, bigger picture, I think that would have been far more effective use of time and energy to really just focus on the bits that matter the most. That's cool. So I mentioned this at the top of the call, but you guys have had 115 conversations recorded for the world to consume. They've had plenty more conversations. We have 115 episodes that I saw on the site that you guys got posted. What, what is some of the lessons that you've been learning? I mean, you've got 115 people who have come onto the show and they've left, they've left their mark and their impressions. Obviously, you mentioned like, the chess coaches and things of that nature. But then you've got um, really incredible practitioners in Hacker Valley Red, Hacker Valley Static Blue, in those series that you've created as well. Um, so you guys just must be inundated with phenomenal ideas in the presence of all of these uh, people in the security community. So what are some of the things you've taken away from that or any highlights that you think were like, man, that was just a great conversation, changed the way I think about security, changed the way I think about innovation and bringing change to the market. What I've learned, which is really amazing, is everyone has a story. And doing all of the post-production work, like having the conversation is one thing, but what happens after the podcast is something really special because we have to go back and listen to the episode. We have to kind of digest it. And then we have to transcribe it, uh, convert it into show notes, convert it into autograms. So there's just so much information that we unpack during and even after the episode. And I feel like mm. after every episode, I have a little baseball card on every person that we have brought in. Everyone has some story about how they got into their expertise. They have, they have a profile about uh, what is their comfort zone? They, they have comfort zones and, and they, they've ultimately stepped out of it. And it's, it's really interesting to get to know what is the comfort zone of our guests and how did they break out of it? Uh, when Chris and I first got into technology, we didn't have many examples in front of us that, that were technologists. We, we didn't have family members. I think Chris and I might have been both the first people in our family to graduate from college. So we really had to step out of our comfort zone to even get into the position that we're into today. And everyone has that story about how they had to face adversity, uh, kind of go on that, hero, that hero's journey and fight a dragon and ultimately win, mm -hmm. or they're still doing that battle, continuing that journey. Um, so I think the, just kind of experiencing the range of heroes that are out there and, and experiencing all the superpowers that our guests have has been kind of the eye-opening experience for, for me. Um, superpowers, this is the second time I've had a guest on the show who talks about <laughs> unique superpowers within people in cybersecurity. Um, I, think it's such a, I think it's such a powerful concept to recognize is that there are things that everybody who's listening to this conversation have that they can lean into and develop, and that is their particular superpower. Um, is, is there a particular superpower from some of your guests that have really stood out from you or some themes that have come out? Man, there are so many superpowers uh, in the show, and we've been really fortunate to see that side of people because it's not something that people talk about all the time. It's like, hey, you want to know what my superpower is? Like, it, You almost have to ask them in order for them to tell you what their superpower is or observe it yourself. Um, but there's so many different superpowers. Like if you listen to the Suzanne Falter episode, her ability to just speak and draw the listener in is like a superpower beyond a superpower. And understanding how to get happy after tragedy is a superpower that she has as well. And if you really look at all the, the guests that we have, they have different superpowers. Some people are just funny. They're, that's their superpowers. They use their humor to communicate. 
uh, almost like uh, like Daniel Mead. He's super, super, super funny. But if you listen to that episode, the, the source of that, that humor and that funny comes from a really, really deep place. And so I learned, we learned so much about the humanity of folks and how they apply it to such a technical field like cybersecurity. And it's something that I, I really wouldn't change for the world. And I can't believe that that's part of what Ron and I do is do this on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, one of the best superpowers that I've seen on our show was the superpower to find superpowers. We had yeah. um, a guest on, her name is Laura Garnett, and her superpower is helping other people find their superpower. And also, how do you leverage your superpower? Because when you're using your superpower, you have challenges. There's always that kryptonite. And she calls it the core emotional challenge. So mm -hmm. she helps people and companies find the superpower and also their kryptonite, their core emotional challenge. So Ron, that's a pretty incredible superpower for someone to have, like Laura, this ability to find someone's superpower. Like it's so hard to see that, I think as you're referring to Chris, like you can look in the mirror and sometimes you just, it's like that, there's a wonderful little meme out there where the cat's looking at the mirror and sees the lion, right? But the house cat, <laughs> yeah. I like, sometimes we just look and we don't see that. And sometimes you need someone to point out like, no, 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 you're the lion in this case, you know? Um, we had a, a guest on the show earlier, um, Michael Piasante, and he's a, yeah. he places CISOs and really helps mm -hmm. people find that long-term home and security for them. And that's what he was exactly talking about. It's like these CISOs these have the incredible superpowers and often they can't see it because they're like, they're just tripping over their own skills. They have so many of these things. They just think it's normal and it's not, it really is a superpower. Right. So, you know, you guys have built this pretty incredible community, community in the cybersecurity world around mental athletes around, I would just call it the complete human and kind of the health and fitness of that complete human. What are some of the, so one of the things I want to talk about is just this idea of building communities within communities, building and helping pull people together around common positive things that we see. So when, what are some of the things that you've been able to do um, to really help draw this community around Hacker Valley Studio? And the kind of the follow-up question to that is, where do podcasts play in this? Um, and granted, there's a, it's obviously a consumption mechanism about this, but the frequency mm -hmm. of being delivery and all of that as a tool. So I'd love to get your thoughts on like how to build healthy communities within the cybersecurity, cybersecurity community. You know, it's funny because when we started the podcast, we didn't think about starting a community. We didn't think about starting a business. We wanted to have awesome conversations and just share them. That's really mm -hmm. the start of the podcast. But slowly but surely, we started to realize that our podcast was making an impact on people. And and that, that's incredible. And people started to share and, and, and have conversations with each other because they were finding people that were like them, but then in some ways, very, very different. And so when you have that diversity of thought, you have that diversity of backgrounds, and you have all these people that want to get better together and share the tools, techniques, and, and the, the trade craft that they've cultivated over a long time, that's when you, you, you know, high tire raises all boats. And I, I, I'm floored at, you know, this little community we've been able to build. You know, we have mastermind meetings where people share about their personal and professional challenges, and we talk about, and we give each person time to focus on, you know, this is my problem. This is what I'm trying to do this next month would love advice and to be able to pull from all these different people and their different mm -hmm. aspects. So we have one person that's go, go, go hard charger, like not, I'm not going to sleep until I'm finished. But then we have another person on the call that's a little bit more like be okay with yourself, like be okay with the process, be okay with the progress that you're making. Don't over exert yourself. And so this weird, but perfectly uh, balanced yin yang sort of happens on the call. So I, I just love the fact that this community is so positive because there's a lot of negativity in yes. cybersecurity, especially on, on Twitter. There's a lot of flame wars that are still going on and, and there's a lot of condescending talk. And we try to really stay away from all of that. I mean, there's a lot of negativity that you can focus on in, in cybersecurity. And not that you, you can't just like do away with all the negativity because you do have to focus on the threats. You have to figure out how you're gonna protect the people that you care about. But a lot of people don't really focus on the positive side, the human side, the we can do it together side. So that's where we kind of reside and we love being in that realm. I, I couldn't, and I, I think the fruits of that are pretty evident. 
right? That you've got all these individuals who are just, you know, they're, cons they're able to connect on YouTube, they're able to connect um, uh, through the podcast and the groups that you've placed around that because it's just it's such a good positive voice to have where we're there to kind of lift each other up in a time, as you mentioned, there's a lot of negativity going on. Mm. <laughs> there's a lot of things to be upset about and people are just inflaming all of that conversation. Yeah. So there is one thing I wanted to get both of your thoughts on as we look to the future. Um, we, you are in a place with a voice in the, in the new media um, with the podcast and the, the YouTube station a show. And so we, but you also come from the cybersecurity space, so you'll understand where I'm going with this. So we are in a universe where deep fakes are becoming a thing. We've seen mm -hmm. hacks on like Parler where the um, kind of the, the right, alt-right um, social media platform that got hacked and such. And we're seeing lots of um, th um, throw, throw back back at Twitter and Facebook for how they're handling certain policies and such. So again, going back to a lot of negativity, but I'm curious your thought, like here we are, this community of cyber experts, we've got, we understand technology in and out, but how do we start to bring trust into the future of media? And just kind of get your perspective on what are some of the things that like basics that we can do today to help that trust, or then also at a whole larger picture, maybe sy systemically or systematically, what are some of the adjustments we should be making as well? I think cybersecurity as a whole is changing constantly. And I think we've always understood that. Years ago, the focus was on the perimeter. We would focus on firewalls, routers, endpoint. But now we're starting to switch and focus gears on the cloud. And we are introducing things like artificial intelligence, machine learning. These kind of new technologies, they don't have much security baked in. There's no way to stop someone from poisoning the well or creating a new well of something like deep fakes, collecting enough images of yourself to ultimately um, uh, pose as someone else. And I think that we're going to see cybersecurity start to go into those fields, start to kind of form AI and ML and, and also social, social media. There's very little that we have capabilities for today when it comes to harassment, um, as Chris was talking about, socioeconomic uh, injustices. You know, we're building these things in now, and I think as we look into the future, we're going to start to see cybersecurity practitioners help out there, really specialize there, create new solutions and new opportunities for us to exist in a safe uh, and connected world. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. And I think the cybersecurity community does need to rise to the challenge and bring this these, what effectively has about two to three decades of just thinking, how do we pretend to be the adversary, break it down into a risk model, and then understand prioritization of efforts and going forward. Because I think the compounding changes that are about to crash on our little shore is uh, can be pretty intense, you know, <laughs> where you can't trust what you read, you can't trust what you see, you can't trust what you hear. We're in for a world where we need individuals who can just be like, step away from the noise and say, okay, here's some tools and process and shift uh, moving away from the fakes from the reality. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Right. I actually met a, uh, a data researcher, uh, he was a machine learning expert, and he said he was in cybersecurity. He focuses on stopping people from beating things like CAPTCHAs <laughs> and um, other things that are automatically generated. because to defeat a CAPTCHA that uh, is using some type of algorithm, the algorithm might not even know what the CAPTCHA says. Maybe you can put like a, a fake body of text and this researcher is focusing on how do you defeat things like CAPTCHAs, facial recognition and other AI and ML, <clears throat> AI and ML implemented algorithms. Got it, yeah, that's fantastic. See, that, that's exactly what I think the security community is gonna go into is building that out, building out these tool sets um, because God knows, uh, you know, eventually we have the AI wars of like AI is here to protect us and the AI is defeating that AI and there'll be the super AI that's uh, going over all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say the thing that I would be looking forward to uh, both on the consumer end, on the AI end, on the cybersecurity is really transparency because there's more and more data out there. We had somebody on the podcast that we were talking about uh, ambient computing, the, the amount of data, the sh sheer amount of data about each person out there, whether it's through applications or the things that they use is, is astounding. But 
I think the way to get around that to keep it seemingly uh, from being seemingly dark and ominous is to really just have transparency on what data folks are collecting, what access that um, folks have to specifics about a human being, and then also the intent of the utilization of that data. Because sometimes I think, sure, they might list what they're having access to, but what are they going to do with that data? Like, right. what, what use does that data have? So. I think both on the cybersecurity side, on the consumer side, the more transparency that we have about that, that use of that data is going to be better. Yeah, I think the open source community has a part to play in this too. It's just like, mm -hmm. okay, so we can start taking these training models that we're doing with the ML and start publishing them on, you just throw that stuff on GitHub and it's just like, okay, now we understand we can, if we had the same data, we come to the same conclusions and we can start to work out, is this a thing inherently biased one way or the other and start, <laughs> Start, save us from the reliving the Netflix series of a uh, broke dark mirror. All right, yeah. <laughs> we want to stay away from that. <laughs> so guys, I really just want to thank you so much for your time and coming on the show today. It's been an incredible conversation. And I love the fact that you are on this mission to help really the humans in cybersecurity be more complete and be more well-rounded um, and be that fitter, healthier versions of ourselves so that we can in, in do a better job for the people that we protect in the communities that we serve. So I just want to say thank you very much for joining the show. And for everyone who's watching this, if you've really enjoyed the conversation with Chris and Ron, please jump over to Hacker Valley Studio. If you feel you've got a voice and you need help getting the podcast going and need them some guidance from some seasoned professionals, they're here <laughs> to help as well. So guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Connor.